Our next subject is atheism, true or false. Our speaker to address this subject is Brother Terry Hightower. He's a native of Florida. He's a grandson of an evangelist, Wesley M. Martin. He's married to Vicki, formerly McCullough. She put up with him for 39 years. I have a daughter, Casey, and a son, Brett. He's a deacon in the church in Amarillo. His grandsons, Reagan and Brantley, and granddaughter, Maddie. Preached in Arkansas, Florida, Wyoming, Texas. Done Bible chair work in both Florida and Wyoming. And uh, he's a graduate of several different institutions, uh, educational institutions. Uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure that those of you who don't know Terry understand that. Then when you're exposed to him, you'll understand why I emphasize that. He's written several, well, many, many articles. And he also wrote a, a book on the case for the Christian policeman. Did some marvelous work in directing the lecture some years ago in uh, San Antonio, the Shenandoah lectureship at that time. I think they were about seven of them, very well received books, and you can still get them, they're, they're excellent material. He's had some debates, and he has uh, now moved, what, about three years ago, Terry? Yeah, about Something like four, that, four, four to uh, Vega, Texas, and he preaches there, as well as does uh, work in the school as a secular substitute teacher, or a secular school. And uh, that's about all I want to say about him. That's all he wrote down here for me to say about Terry. Terry's an uh, excellent student of the Bible, good writer and good speaker. We want to hear him speak to us now on atheism, true or false. I'm going to do a little surgery here with you. Probably going to be good enough. Maybe a little bit. Just a pinchy bit. That's that's better. That's a whole lot better. Thanks. A university biology professor traditionally began his semester with the quip, Christians say, in the beginning, God. He said, I say, in the beginning, hydrogen. One of the reasons that I am not an atheist, or the title of this is Atheism, True or False, and I'm going to say false, is because uh, I am a rational person. I believe that I can deduce from the things that are around me from this cosmos and that I can reason about that. Uh, many young people have been misled about this. They believe that they have to put their mind out of gear in order to be a Christian, or in order to be even a theist, a believer uh, in deity. In August, uh, I think it was the 7th of August, 1961, 26-year-old uh, Major German Titov uh, was the second Soviet cosmonaut to orbit the Earth and to return safely climaxing, of course, a very monumental feat for, or for mankind, even if it wasn't America that did it. You had to admit that. But sometime later, he was speaking at the World's Fair, and he was really in the moment. He was savoring the moment. He recounted this experience uh, in space, and which, of course, has only been given to just a very few, especially at that time. And uh, he let it be known that in his excursion into space, he hadn't seen God. He had not experienced God with his five senses, in other words, empirically. Someone, upon hearing uh, Titoff saying that, he said, had he stepped out of his spacesuit, he would have. <laughs> he would have seen God, and that's really correct. Go ahead and put the first one up. I'm going to kind of depart, uh, instead of doing a high tower blitz that I usually do, we're going to still do a blitz, of course, 
uh, I have a reputation to keep up. Uh, but the fact is we're going to do it with some things that many things that are not found uh, in the book. I, I think page 90, well, we will hopefully get to an argument that I set out concerning the teleological argument for the existence of God. But in the shortness of time, I just want to sort of take the other side of it like the Russian cosmonaut. And you'll notice here about the origin of the universe, uh, the origin, I'm going to change it a little bit and say between five and 6,000 years ago, but supposedly it began, began with just a big bang. All the matter in existence which had uh, compacted supposedly into a tiny ball. Now this is what they actually hold, between 40 and 50 pounds. I have heard 65. I'll give them 100 if they want. But the whole cosmos and everything that you see in this room, in this state, in this nation, on this globe, the Earth, and all different things of our Milky Way galaxy, in effect especially coming into being the Earth and everything on it, came from a, supposedly about 40 or 50 pounds of compacted, well, whatever. Uh, and notice here, it explosively flew apart. No one knows what caused it. Remember, I'm taking their side. No one knows what caused it, but kids playing with matches is a thing that's suspected to cause the Big Bang. So, and here's some types of galaxies. Uh, the primordial matter spread out. It began to coalesce into uh, celestial objects that we see and know today. You know, galaxies, uh, stars, planets, and dust bunnies. And, and these are types of galaxies. This is a spiral one. You're probably familiar with that. This is a square galaxy. This is a Frisbee galaxy. And this is a Nazi, obviously, Nazi galaxy. Next, next slide, if you would. Uh, this is the Milky Way uh, galaxy, which, of course, was named after a candy bar. <laughs> Go to the next one then, Kevin. We'll keep moving. This is what we call the old blue marble, and, uh, and we live on this, and it is a gorgeous thing, and we have an internet, and we need to get into it and just see exactly what it's all about. Uh, we're not really dealing just with fun and games. We're going to have a little fun, maybe, like we're uh, so far trying to do, to, to make you think and to make you see that faith does not equal a leap in the dark, but it is based on reality. And had that, is it the case, even if we just raised the question of that Russian cosmonaut, had he come out of that spacesuit somehow, would he have met God? Well, is there a God? Just to raise the question is to deal with some the most profound question you can ask yourself, because it has to do with reality. Either God exists, and there's evidence that proves that, and you can know it, or he does not exist. Go to the next one, if you would. I want to explain this to you here where you can kind of follow this, and you'll notice that there are just some, were some I'm trying to simplify it, some simple one-cell protoplasm, and then two-celled animals came along, and they were supposedly followed by three cells, then four cells, then five cells, and so on. You know, uh, uh, if you, you, know, you shouldn't find the math uh, too difficult here. Just think of, you know, not the numbers larger than one as many. And that will explain it to you. And over here, you'll notice we have uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, creatures, earliest reptile. That's what he looked like. This is the earliest bird. And this is the earliest mammal. And down here, we've got some worms I wanted to show you. That's obviously a round worm. This is a flat worm. This is a, squ a square worm. You have to look close. You see it's little squares and cubes. And then this is a triangular worm. Okay, triangular worms here. Well, come up, just push it up just a little bit, Kevin. Uh, animals are given, uh, of a given species are alike because they inherit a certain set of genes from their parents. Every so often, something goes wrong with the mechanism that transmits the, the genes, and an animal is born that doesn't resemble its father and mother. You probably know of examples in your own family. <laughs> but enough about Lester Kemp. We've got to move on. If this accidental variation or mutation is helpful, we're told, and by macroevolutionists in the animal struggle uh, to survive, it is more likely to be passed on to succeeding generations in this way, 
supposedly, we're, we are told, of course, that new species can arise. The next one, please. We're going to unveil a, a masterpiece. I would recommend that you get this book and read it. And it's some heavy reading, but it's some enjoyable, great reading. And you will marvel about this and studying this uh, book by a man named uh, Raina, Fazael Raina. It's called The Cell's Design and How Chemistry Reveals the Creator's Artistry. And it is simply fantastic to get into this. And you don't even have to buy books now. You just go on the Internet. And I strongly urge that you, that you do uh, this. I have some sheets. I did not bring them down tonight. But I will put them over into the, uh, the other room over uh, where we eat and so forth. And I'll try to have those later on either tonight or by tomorrow morning. But I hope that you'll pick up some of those. One of the sheets is basically a sheet for you to ask your science teacher, your biology teacher, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you ought to be asking this, whether you're in college or whether you're in high school. Uh, there's a change of events now uh, that is going on, a tremendous revolution that is going on in biology and in all of, you could say, of science. Go to the next one, if you would. And just an example, just thinking about microscopic life. And Darwin, of course, was in the situation where he didn't know how the cell worked. But modern biochemists, though, today have discovered that our cells contain, of course, a micro world of molecular machines that function like a factory or a miniature city. Did you know, young people, are you listening, that there were over 700 scientists recently who have signed a statement agreeing that the integrated, organized complexity of life is not what we would expect from a random and unguided process such as Darwinian evolution. That's at uh, www.descentfromdarwin.com. And, and parents and grandparents, you better have your children getting into this and studying it. Is it not the case, and you preachers know this and elders, that it's almost a mass exodus in even the Lord's church of kids leaving? Where are they? Where are the young people? They have been fed a line about reality that the Bible and or God is not uh, subject to reasoning. It's just some sort of jump out into the dark in which you don't know whether God's there. You don't know whether the Bible is true or not. And unless we remedy this by our preaching and our, the elderships to get serious about it, this mass exodus, uh, when they hit 18 and leave home and go into the military or to college or whatever, go off to work, and we turn around and say, where are they? And if we have 10%, 10%, I would say, that are still hanging in with the truth, uh, that is really a high percentage almost, isn't it? You elders know this. Some of you are nodding yes. We need to do something about it. We need to have it where a young person, when he comes out of a congregation, and I'm, I'm hearing, I heard some good things from John, about concerning John West and the young people here, and we commend you for that and hope that you continue to study in such a way that you will be able to handle these people. And you can do it, and there's all kinds of helps available to you, which was not available to some of us about 35 or 40 years ago. And it is simply uh, overwhelming to study this. But uh, the fact is, uh, one person wrote, Her Franklin Harold observed in an Oxford University monograph, he said, there are presently no de detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical or cellular system. Only a variety, are you listening? Only a variety of wishful speculation. You know what that is? That's the macroevolution fairy tale. Sometimes we joke around and say it's sort of like if you, you know, you kiss the frog long enough, he'll evolve into a prince if you have enough time. Uh, but the fact is, you can kiss a frog from here to millions and billions of years. I'll give you all the time you want. And you'll never change that into a human being. And we know this, and this from biochemistry uh, now. Uh, go to the next one. I'm going to show you here. This is what's called a bacterium flagellum. Uh, and it's one of the most complex, complex and elegant uh, pieces of bacterial machinery that is known. 
it is the, it's only because we have electron microscopes that we're able to get into all this stuff, which didn't really begin until somewhere in the, in the early 50s. It is, you can't do it with a regular old microscope. Darwin didn't know about any of this. Uh, it, it's the, it is the bacterial world's outboard uh, motor in effect here, uh, and it rotating at high speeds to propel the bacteria through their watery environments. And it's made up of about somewhere between 40 or maybe 50 proteins that self-assemble into three basic modules, the basal body, the hook, and the filament. Go to the next one. That's a physical model that has been made of the bacterial flagellum imaged and modeled at Brandeis University uh, in this guy named DeRossier's lab and printed at the University of Wisconsin. And you look at that. And it's a marvel of engineering. It looks, does that look somewhat like some machinery to you? Like a motor? That's exactly what it is. Go to the next one. It shows it really even uh, better. It's a very interesting uh, structure here. Uh, in fact, that one was from the Salmonella. I, I, I'm jumping. Go back to the, the, the one right before. I'm sorry. And starting from the top, just very quickly to run through this. I know I'm going to run out of time, and I keep thinking to jump some things here. But you have in, in blue, starting from the top, in blue, the axial, axial helical components, including the cap, the hook filament junction, the hook or universal joint, uh, and, a, and a rod or a drive shaft is involved. And in purple light, or kind of light blue really on this model, uh, the L and P rings, or what we commonly call bushings, uh, in yellow. And, and just various things that it just gets very complicated here to even try to pronounce and to, and to describe it. Now what we're dealing with, go to the next one now, Kevin, thanks. Uh, the teleological argument, about as simply as can be put, this is the design argument. Uh, uh, the word telos or telos is used in the New Testament numerous times, and the Bible's not so foolish to us to deny that there is design. Every house is built by some man, but of course he who built all things, Hebrews 3 verse 4, is God. Now that may primarily have a reference more to the, the person's house, not in a physical sense, but his, his descendants, his household, but it's still true, and imagine if the Bible had said opposite of that. Nobody built that house over there. Nobody built this building. Imagine if, if God had said that. I have no doubt that some atheists would have jumped on it and gone the other way just because they found that in the Bible. Uh, but it's, it's true. There is design. And we're just saying that if order and adjustment in the material world exists, then a designer exists. Order and adjustment in the material world does exist. That's what we're showing with the bacterium flagellum. And shove it up just a little bit, Kevin, there. Therefore, a designer exists. Now go to the next one, if you would. In 1996, and this is in the book, uh, a lot of this, not all of it, you'll need to get on the internet like I suggested in the book, uh, but to, I'm not going to go into the details of it like I have in the book of the argument and explaining terms and all that. I'm going to let you read that. I believe it's on page 90 is where that starts. But what we're talking about is something that by order we're meaning arranged or organized so that the whole works as a unit with each thing or component part having a proper function, duty, or the like. The thing makes sense, and it, things only make sense with a designer, someone, something, some entity that has a mind or intelligence. In other words, fashioned according to a definite predetermined plan which cannot, and I cannot overstress this, which cannot be explained by purely natural forces. By adjustment, we mean an act or process of establishing a satisfactory relationship as representing harmony, conformance, adaptation, and the like, the involving the purposeful bringing of a thing or things into a proper or exact position or condition for functionality, uh, to bring to a true relative position as the parts of an instrument or to regulate for use, for instance, as a carburetor, or now we have uh, fuel injectors, uh, uh, a fuel injection system, or something like the whole motor involved in something. And it's what is now uh, described, it's instead of saying order and adjustment, that's what I'm pleading for in my argument, 
and defining it as I did, now you can just basically say it's what Mr. Behe and others call irreducible or Dembski, William Dembski calls it, specified complexity. Irreducible complexity uh, or specified complexity uh, by the intelligent design movement. And if you haven't read any of this, parents and grandparents, you need to. You need to see this. We need to be inculcating it all the way and undoing things that have already been done to many of our kids in elementary school, in, in middle school, and particularly in high school biology classes, and certainly uh, in college. Uh, there has been a change. It's been a, a, a colossal thing that is happening, as I said, in the scientific uh, world. But I want you to look at this thing. And this is what it looks like. And, and, you know, you have a stator, which is the part that doesn't actually move, and you have to have that to have the movement of the motor part of it. You'll notice we have an S ring, an M ring here, which is, of course, uh, put together. That's what we call a rotor. And uh, then the inner plasma, you know, membrane, it's showing some of that. And then the, the, you have, finally, the business end down here, it's hooked through this hook or the universal joint that it has to have. The propeller is hooked on right here, and this turns. There's other motors, by the way. This is just one of them. When you, when you read and you see, like in the book I mentioned a while ago, uh, uh, it's about the cell, and it, it is incredible to look at the different kind of motors. And some, something happened where uh, one of them I was studying, and I started to do some more on that, and I knew I wouldn't get through with this one, but it actually, it, it carries stuff, and it has a little propeller, and it moves along the top of this other part and is carrying loads from one place to another, kind of as if it made sense and there might be some purpose to that movement. What do you think? And, and, and then it, when it gets a heavier load, I wish Vicki, my wife, would do this, but she doesn't a lot of the time, uh, and, and making me carry boxes or when we're moving, you know, or whatever. But that thing, when it gets an extra heavy load and it's bigger here, it actually downshifts and does the little short movement. To get, but you won't let me, boy. It's full speed. You know, hey, let's get after it, you know. Well, uh, but we have a motor here, folks. It's a motor boat of sorts, you understand. You might think, not to be crude here, but think of a sperm, which then will unite with an egg and it has a tail moving it, propelling it. That's no accident. You're not here by accident. I'm not here by accident. Somebody put a motor on this stuff. Uh, and, and Michael Behe in 1996, uh, what, we're, what he's saying is this bacterial flagellum uh, requires about 50 or so different separate proteins for its operation. It's just simply unbelievable when you get into this. And he shook the scientific world up in 1996. He's written, written another book, which I just recently completed. Uh, I didn't have time to read it before I did the material for the book. Uh, but it's called The Edge of Evolution. And you have to understand, all these people are not just strictly Bible believers. He's not. His background is Roman Catholic. He believes there might be millions of years. But one thing Dr. Michael Behe, who is a biochemistry professor and has been for years, at Lehigh University here in America, he knows this thing didn't just happen. He knows it did not just happen. It did not just blow itself together. There is design about it, and he has proved that in his uh, materials. So go to, go to the next one. It, there's a nice drawing of it, and it is, like we're saying up here, a biological rotary motor. That's exactly what that is, and it doesn't run on gas. <laughs> it doesn't run on diesel fuel either. You know what it runs on? I could say God's energy, but it runs on acid. And they can't make this thing. Do you realize that when you look at this, it's just basically showing the same thing again. But you know that thing back there, the tail, that that thing can run up to 100,000 RPM. Every one of them. And do you know how many there are? There are 8,000 of them in the diameter of a human hair. Every slice across a human hair, there is 8,000 of those things. Now you let that sink in. You think you, hey, I'll, I'll assign you between now and next week, how about making us some of those and bringing some in, you know? I'll tell you, we'll give you a couple of weeks. 
I'll give you a year. I'll give you 10 years to make something of a nano motor like this. 8,000 in one diameter slice of a human, the width of a human hair. You just imagine that. It just staggers your mind. Is it, is it any wonder <clears throat> when you look at Paul's writing and why he says in Romans 1, young people, without excuse. Even if you don't accept the Bible, you have to accept this kind of evidence that at least proves that there is, there is a deity. There is a designer, and then you better set about finding out whether the Bible is, is corresponding to the one God or not. There can't be but one God. You can't have but one omnipotent being uh, anyway. <clears throat> but notice, if it looks designed, they said in this drawing, maybe it is. Uh, this is the E. coli bacterium. Now, I hope you'll read my material in the book, and that'll be a springboard for you. You can go online now. I don't think I put it in the footnotes uh, but if you go online, you can find this where they actually will show you one and how it puts itself together. And it has to start from the bottom and start down here and work up this way and finally end up with this. Did you know, not only 100,000 RPM, but that thing can stop just like that and go back the other way. No human, it's almost a 100% efficient engine or motor, and it propels it as if it had some sort of purpose. Well, about the only thing an atheist can do is dream up certain little scenarios, and Mr. Dr. Behe and many others have answered all of that, if you'll just look and see, and some of it we put uh, in the book. But, you know, you know, Michael Phelps can't, you know, <laughs> he can't, <laughs> I don't care if he's, you know, smoking marijuana, which he shouldn't have been doing in the first place, Marijuana or no marijuana, he cannot touch the situation. But he may have those in his stomach, though. You've got them probably right now. I think 8,000 in the slice of a human hair. I mean, it's just staggering, folks. And only electron microscope is the only way that we can, you know, see these things and know that they're there. Certainly Darwin didn't know it. He and his followers basically at the beginning just looked at, well, it's a blob of protoplasm, a simple cell. There is no such thing as a simple cell. And the only reason you're alive is because there's somebody back of this situation. Uh, a man by the, the Rosier that I mentioned a while ago, he said this, more about this, more this biological rotary motor you're looking at here, more so than other motors, the flagellum resembles a machine designed by a human. And to that I said, duh. It resembled a motor that's designed by a human. But it just, it just happened. Are you a cosmic accident or what? Go to the next one if you would. This is another Dr. Uh, Michael Behe illustration. And I highly recommend parents and grandparents just buy Behe's books, especially Darwin's Black Box. Uh, that Darwin's back black box just means Darwin didn't know what was in there. Pull it, pull it down first, if you would, so they can see that. Well, okay, that's fine. And you see the flagellar filament that we're talking about here, and this is the motor that turns. But you have to have this hook here for it to, all of this to work together. And there's even a bearing. One deal I was reading about the other day, it even coats stuff. It sounded like Slick 50 or something. And somebody made some slick 50 that coats the thing, and it, and it works better and runs without friction. Now, you just think about that. But when we come up with things like that, oh, that, that had to be designed. Some human did it. They'll say, that's an ar ar artifact, Mr. Hightower. Well, I've got more sense than that. I don't know about you, but you should have more sense than that to see that when something is a motor, it's a motor. And we cannot make this stuff. Notice again that a rotor here and stator, which is the non-moving part, or otherwise this thing, of course, you have to have all these parts and they have to come uh, together. Now, if I try to convince you, here's the simplest one. I know we've got, you know, people uh, like Lester Camp in here, and I have to keep it simple. Uh, so I brought this one for Lester. This is called the Deep Seeker. It has a little motor on it. I paid about 2 or $3 for it, as small as it is. And you crank it up. Can you hear it? It's got a propeller here on the end. I'm holding it. Lester, are you watching? Uh, okay, here we go. This just blew itself together. There was some plastic out here on the parking lot this afternoon. Hey, even Lester knows better than that. 
Okay, now, on the left of you may have a little more problem with this one. It's going to get heavy. Have your son help you. He's sitting there with you, I think. Uh, and this one has a deal on the bottom, and you crank it up. It has a motor, and I'm holding the propeller again. This one goes a little longer. This is a uh, auto submarine, number 801, and you can take this in the bathtub with you. Don't say it, Lester. I know what you're thinking about my bathtub stuff. But anyway, look, are you listening? <laughs> this baby blew itself together, too. It just happened. This one's even got the things on the side which will make it dive in your in your tubby. You know, don't let it hit your little yellow duck, Lester, uh, because there may be a problem there. That blew itself together, too. It's an accident. It has a motor in it. That doesn't even start to compare with what we're talking about here. We can't make this stuff somebody else greater, higher, more noggin power made it and not us. Shove it up just a little bit. I want to see what I, I want to see what I'm supposed to do next. Uh, here's what we're talking about. In fact, let me. I want to give another one, and uh, this one is from Michael Hatcher because he's kind of slow like Lester. Uh, Michael, are you watching? Okay. Did it just happen or not? Come on, you bought Snuggies, too. I know you wanted one. Run your arm in, get on the couch, you know, hey. And let me do it again. If you, Michael, you watch it again. Lester, are you watching? Get your son. Pump, pump, bump him there and wake him back up. Okay, here it goes again. Are you watching? You know, somebody might even figure out that's a reading light. You can put it on your Bible or your book, you know, and you got a light there, and you sit there and not have to use all the rest of the lights, and, you know, uh, why? Because this thing exhibits characters about it of order and adjustment of such a nature that it didn't blow itself together. That's why it's that simple. Now here's what Dr. Behe did, and I'm illustrating it for you. This is irreducible complexity as illustrated. This was his great, this is just torn these people out of the frame, uh, and they can't handle it. But where you have to have to have a decent mount strap, you have to have all of the components have to be there and from the beginning or it won't work. If you only got 80%, it doesn't just work 80%. It, it doesn't work at all. You got it? That's his illustration. And you should just read these people. I have laughed tears roll out of my eyes and reading these explanations for this stuff. You see this one up here? It's missing the spring. Is it going to catch a mousy? No. Uh, here's one. It's missing this holding bar here. And just that part, these have to all, quote, he's illustrating, have to all evolve together and be there at the same time. Uh, here's one that, of course, is missing uh, the actual hammer part, they call this, that flops over. It won't catch any mice either. And here's one that here the catch, the holding thing for the bar, the bar here, the holding bar to come across and stick up in there. It's no good. None of these four work. Well, wait a minute. What about what about this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece uh, uh, put together? Uh, that'll do it, won't it? Just those. No, dummy, you've got to have a platform to start with. You have to have all of those parts. And that's what it is multiplied by millions of things in, this, in our earth, in our cosmos, and that's what's going to judge you in the last day. You say, oh, well, I, I, they told me it just happened. The cosmic accident. Here's one that actually works right there. I was messing around with it the other day, and it got me. So, you know, you can know some things, but not everything uh, about it. But you, you will let you try it afterwards if you want to look this over. Uh, just be careful with it. I don't believe a Christian ought to sue another Christian. I'm with Paul. And, and the other thing is, I just went ahead and got a big one, so I wanted you to be able to see it back there. Bruce, are you watching? Okay, there's one that got one. See? If you don't have all of these parts here, you won't get a mouse. And that means in things that are ir of irreducible complexity, all of the component parts are required and from the beginning. 
I wish I had time to go into the angler fish and all that and try to explain to you what an evolutionist says about, you know what an angler fish is? I, I, I started to bring it. I have it with me, but I'd leave it up in the rooms and run out of time. Anyway, but you know, he's got a deal that comes out. He's got a fishing rod here. Well, you know, did he start with a little mole on his nose or what? And then it lengthened out and it lengthened out. And if I, he's got a, he's an angler fish. He baits, he's got a, he's got a lure on the end of that thing like some of you fishermen use when you're going after bass or trout. And that blew itself together. I mean, there's so many illustrations of this, and I hadn't even gotten to the duck bill platypus. Uh, it's all about blowing your mind, boy. And the male has poison deals on his back feet can spike you and poison you. Think about all snakes evolved their venom. But there was no mind behind that. There was no purpose to the venom when it was evolving. Or was it? Or was it? You think about that. If you have any real sense about it, you know better uh, than that. The undirected nature of, of Darwinism and its supposed mechanism uh, could not support a gradual accumulation of the necessary proteins of just the bacterium flagellum by itself because that offers no survival or reproductive advantage whatsoever. And, and nothing works until everything works. Have you got it? Nothing works until unless everything works. How could nature know that the bacterium flagellum uh, was in the process of building itself a motor? Now, when you answer that, you'll believe in God even if you didn't before. If you look at this stuff, it's just not, it's just not that hard. Now, I want to show you, and we're doing this the simple way again. I have to break it down because I have Michael Hatcher and Lester uh, Camp and other people like that. They're pretty slow. And so this is the, well, what is that? What does that look like to you? It's a Venus flytrap. It has batteries in it. And it works. If there were flies in this room, it's the wrong time of year, you can put that in your room. And I suggest parents, grandparents, buy them. Instead of buying stuff that's, you know, worthless as far as thinking and about God and the Bible and serious things. I mean, I have a lot of fun, as you can tell. But and I buy fun things sometimes for my grandson or granddaughter. But we need to do some of this stuff and get them thinking on the serious stuff and what life's all about. And this thing actually works. If the fly comes here, it, here's the instruction sheet that comes with this one. It's an electronic Venus fly trap. Costs about ten bucks, by the way, if you want one. Not that expensive. Uh, and it, it talks about the Venus fly trap. You know they only evolved in North Carolina. They're only in North Carolina. Across the entire globe, I showed a while ago, planet Earth, the big blue ball. There are none that have come about any other way. And, and they find it, the actual, actually, the Venus flytrap is very difficult to grow and must feed off of insects to live, the real one. It lives in a very poor soil that is humid, wet, and swamp-like. The bugs it eats will help it to grow in these tough conditions. And because they're so rare in nature, scientists didn't even believe at first in such things as meat-eating uh, meat carnivorous plants. But that's what this is about. Well, you just, I mean, you should read the explanation you know, about the soil was acidic. So this thing had dry soil, so it started eating insects. Well, when you put the, put the next one, just go to the next couple. I've got to finish up here. Okay, go to the next one. There's how it traps it. Those all evolved, all those kinds right there off of a leaf that didn't have any of those, by the way. Without any forethought to it whatsoever, it just happened. And, and that one you can barely see, but you see the worm in here? Uh, and, and guess what's going to happen to this boy? I've watched them. I've owned them. My grandson, his science teacher at his elementary school, has one in their room right now, and I want to take one of these and show, uh, show this. i got an, another point, but go to the next one. There he is. He's inside now. And that thing, I wish I could go into the details. Uh, and, uh, it, within a small area of 100 miles diameter, that's where the only place this thing supposedly they evolve. And you can buy them, by the way, and they have names like Fang, uh, Big Vigorous, and they named one after me, David. It's called Big Mouth. Uh, the plants allegedly developed their ability to trap insects because the boggy soils in which they evolved were too poor in nutrients to support growth. They attract insects to the traps 
with perfume, a sweet tasting nectar, secreted by the traps, that's an accident, and in most cases the red coloration inside of the traps, uh, and you know, of course, pulls them in also. Each trap has six trigger hairs. When two are touched or one twice in close succession, the trap closes in approximately a half of a second. That all just happened, folks. Trapped insects are digested by fluid secreted around them by the trap once it is tightly sealed. The traps uh, also secrete an antiseptic. You get this? Not the perfume attractant, but it, they secrete an antiseptic to prevent the insect from rotting before it can be digested. And that just happened, too. That's an accident. Uh, it, no forethought. Uh, uh, Five to 12 days for the digestion period, and the traps and foliage have a thick, leathery feel. Buy one of these for your kids or grandkids, and then you have to work with it to keep them, you have to keep the soil moist and acidic uh, to keep them growing and so forth. But it'll actually form a trap, and it'll form a watertight seal. After the initial rough closing like this, it'll, it'll actually form a watertight seal around the, uh, the insect. Well, you see the artificial one that I have here, but I've got one that it must be from South Carolina because this is the fly catcher, and it does the same thing. It actually kills flies. This one costs a little more. It's safe for use around children and pets, by the way. It's somewhere between $15 and $20. I forgot what I paid for it. But uh, it has, you put a little bait in here, and it, and it, like you do this other one, and it attracts the insect into its open mouth and then light sensors in the mouth detect the insect triggering the jaws to snap shut, and the, in the insect in this one's dead. This is the Jeff Foxworthy version of this thing. And I know it's Jeff Foxworthy version because 15 seconds, this one won't do it, but 15 seconds after it catches the fly in this one, it'll burp. It will burp. You can look at this and read it for yourself. It'll belch. And that's a Jeff Foxworthy version of the same thing. But I'll tell you what. What could I do to try to convince you tonight that this thing just happened right here? And if your soul depended on this, of deciding that, what would you answer? This just happened. This one right here I'm holding in my hand. Or even these. Even these. Remember the motor? Remember the motors? Even the, the little one, uh, even the little tiny one here. Did, it, did this just happen? There's no way I could convince anybody here that has a rational bone left in their body that those things just happened, much less something like this, even including the birth. I couldn't do it. If I could, we're going to call the truck and have you picked up. Because that's where your mind has to go to believe all this kind of stuff. Hey, they make fun of the Bible miracles. Don't they? Hey, there's much less to believe in the Bible of miracles than there is in all this kind of stuff. They believe in millions and millions of miracles over millions and millions or billions of years with absolutely no proof for it really whatsoever. In fact, we've disproved it tonight. Let's go to the next one. I've got the clothes here. Well, that's that same one right here that I'm showing you. Yeah, go on to the next one. Uh, and shove it up towards from the, from the well, let me, let me read up here. Atheist Oxford professor Richard Dawkins accepts the moral relative con relativist consequences of atheism and adds, now I want you to think about this, the universe, this is your choice about atheism or theism, the a universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom, and he is an atheist. He's written some militant stuff. He's a new atheist. And he says is that at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no, uh, no other good. Nothing, look at this, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That's no God for you, that's for sure. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. You know, they've come out with a book just two or three years ago that they ascribe rape to just your biological, you know, your biochemistry. That's what causes it, ladies. If you're, if you're ever raped, well, it really wasn't his fault. It's in his genes, don't you see? They're explaining homosexuality and everything else that way, so why not? Well, that's the problem with Darwin. Push it, push it up. I'm going to go down here. 
We're going to end with this and give an invitation here. But notice convicted mass murder, Jeffrey Dahmer, who, of course, was baptized, you understand, before he died and hopefully died in faith, believe it or not. Uh, before his death, he stated this, if a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep uh, it within acceptable ranges? Exactly. He's exactly right. Isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15? If we have only hoped in this life, we are of all men most what? Oh, we live the best life. It's just so what? No, I've heard elders say that to young people, and it's false, and Paul said it's false. It's either true or it's false. And it is true, and that's what Paul is arguing, the only thing that made any sense in all the persecution, all the things that he endured like he lists in Second Corinthians for you, is that it's based on the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Bible being true. So uh, I, this person says, I always believe the theory of evolution, or Jeffrey Dahmer, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from slime. When we died, Jeffrey Dahmer said, you know, that was it. There is nothing. And I've since come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God, and I believe that I, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. You're accountable to him tonight. We're going to sing this song uh, of invitation. And if you need to come forward to either be baptized into Jesus Christ, do it because it is the truth, it is right, you know it to be the truth, and submit yourself to this watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins because you do have some. If you don't believe it, read my section and other people's materials on the moral argument for the existence of God. As we stand and as we sing, if you need to come back, brother or sister, come back right now as we do.